And I think that goes a long way because you're not just the sales guy who's trying to sell them something. Uh, you actually understand why they're there and, and, and what to do. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Promo Minds podcast interview series. I'm your host, Steve Leslie, and today we have a guy on here that is just crushing it in a variety of ways. Uh, him and I actually originally connected probably a, a decade ago when he was the night manager at Norma Jeans and he was booking bands and we played a few Movember gigs um, over the years there had lots of fun. He's now, he still plays in a band called Tommy Rot, which they're just an amazing rock band. You should definitely check them out. Um, there's been a lot of changes over the years with them, but still a great sound. He's also into filmmaking. He's got a feature film coming out in January, which we'll talk up about. And um, above all else, he's also a sales leader. He's crushing it at uh, Volvo Trucks. So I'm so excited to have him here. And uh, please welcome Pete Comrie. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a really nice intro. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining me, Pete. I'm uh, no. excited to hear, like, with everything you got going on. I mean, we kind of talked about this beforehand when we first uh, started talking about doing a show together. Was just how do you even manage to do all these things? So I'm very excited to. To hear more about it um honestly i've got i do have a good support system my family is fantastic so my wife and my kids they all support it you have to find that balance of course but on average yeah you can't do you can't do much if you don't have a good support system behind you so some things don't always work out with the way they want them to but other times they they do so i'm very thankful for that cool well uh once again thank you for joining um, why don't you share with the audience a little bit about your journey and uh, how you got to where you are today? All right. Um, basically, I've always, I just, I love people, always been about people. I, uh, my family had a healthcare company, my mom's business, and I managed that and I worked in that. So I'm a PSW and a DSW since I was, oh God, 10 years old, I was in nursing homes and then I just went through it and kept going and managed the company. Uh, when we sold that, um, I went to restaurants. I was going to open my own restaurant, but I went and managed Norma Jeans first and uh, was, was set to open my own nightclub called Fender's Tex-Mex and Grill. And I had an investor. And by the time the guy who was selling the business, he moved it from like $250,000 to $400,000. And I understood that's a little too much money for my investors. So I had to find something else to do. And uh, a friend of mine who now owns Jerry's Truck Center, he's a family business, uh, called me and said, hey, Pete, I think you'd be good at selling trucks. So, of course, the next logical step from healthcare and restaurants is to sell transport trucks. Um, and, yeah, it was great. I originally said no because I'm not a truck guy. But uh, it took me a little while, and I researched it, and I called him back, and I said, is it still, still available? And uh, I came in, and I... I, uh, I got told no from his dad, Jerry, at first, who was an, who was an amazing man um, because I had no experience whatsoever. Doug convinced him to sit down and have an interview. And two hours later, he said, yeah, give him a shot. And that was 12 years ago. And uh, I've enjoyed diving into the, the business side of things and realizing I never thought I sold anything. And I've always have. It's always service. And even when you have a, a product to sell, it's still service. It's still take care of the person who's in front of you. So, and in the meantime of doing that, from 97, I played in a band called Tommy Rot, uh, released a bunch of records, changed a few lineups, um, kept moving and kept going. And the last album was 2009. Then uh, 2011, kind of stopped playing and focused on work, family. And the last three years, I got back into playing with my original guitar player and then my original bass player. And just kind of jamming away, having some fun. And COVID hit and I had a little more time on my hands. 
I was in a film that Brent Barrett wrote and directed called Seeking Oblivion, which is on Tubi, and had a great time doing that. Had lots of ideas for movies and no one to do them. So I just learned how to be a screenwriter. Um, great thing when you go on for walks at night just to listen to and learn. And so I've built it up, written a few scripts. And then this summer, we just ended up filming uh, A Night with Nathan, which I wrote with uh, Brent Barrett. It was his original idea first. And I also get the chance to, to star in it. So wrote it, acted in it. And uh, now we have the, the stress of getting it finished and released. <laughs> wow. See, that is a lot. That's, that's amazing. I don't a lot think of it's questions a lot. just off of that. I, say, I don't think it's a lot until somebody asks me to lay it out like that. Then I go, yeah, that is a lot. Yeah. So you're, the start of that, you said that your parents had a, uh, was it a, a restaurant or a nursing home? A healthcare company. So when my mom and dad came over from Scotland, um, my mom worked every odd job and she became a nurse's assistant, nurse's aide in a nursing home and saw that so many people weren't able to go to appointments because they had no one to take them. So she made her own business and uh, to take people to appointments. And believe it or not, she actually called it Senior Citizens Escort Service. Uh, wow. After a couple phone calls, she changed the name to not be <laughs> quite as literal to escorting them to appointments. And um, she was helping hands transit. And then it moved into a visiting service and then I came in and we called it Helping Ends Plus because we had PSWs under us and we did everything. Um, and that was fantastic. Uh, so since I was, since I was like five, I've been going in and out of nursing homes. Um, so it's just a logical step to keep moving. And as we went through, of course, just like anybody's, just like anyone's uh, family business, you, you, you don't necessarily always want to do it. So. I went and tried a couple things. I actually went and worked at FM 96 in the Hawk and then came back to the company. And yeah, then I managed a great team of, 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 of PSW and nurses and just helped everybody. It was, it was fantastic. That's amazing. Was, um, was, were your parents also, uh, uh like creative outside of, um, the business or I never really knew. My mom was always, she could, she could pick up the piano and she would teach you a few chords and, and she was always very much do this. She always had her brain going. That's why she started her business. And she always, she was the first, um, female president of the Southwest London Optimist Club. Um, she just always did everything you could imagine. Now my dad, I found out later when he was in Scotland, he was, uh, he actually acted in some community plays and did those things. So music was always in my house and creativity was always there, but it wasn't really massive standout. My, my brother was in a band. That's who got me interested in music. My older brother, I'm the youngest out of, uh, out of uh, we have three of us. I was the coming to Canada celebration. Right? So <laughs> I had no money, had to do something. Um, so yeah, but no, there was always, there was always music and there was always something going on in the house. Hey guys, if you're into hiking at all, I highly recommend subscribing to my YouTube page, Steve Leslie Hikes. That's Steve Leslie Hikes on YouTube. I have a lot of content on there from some of the crazy hikes that I've been on, including Angel's Landing in Zion National Park. And it'd be really cool to connect on there. So please check me out. Thanks. Just going back a little bit to the the uh, healthcare business, helping hands. What was that? Was that your first uh, job, or did you have a job before that? Oh, I since I was a, a kid, I always was working. So when I was twelve, I had my own. Actually, about eleven or twelve, I had my own little business, made flyers and everything. It was called Rent a Kid, and I put them out in the neighborhood, and they could hire me to cut the grass and. I even put down that I'd clean eaves troughs until one of the people called the number and asked my mom if I was allowed to go on the roof. And at 11, she said no. Um, but I always, always had my own little businesses. 
And then when I was 13, I started working at uh, the Bavarian restaurant in London. And I was a busboy and uh, loved it. It was absolutely fantastic. That That's what I think got me into really liking restaurants is I got to, to go in and start off as a busboy. And I just remembered the owner, Ralph Patera, just watching what he was doing and how he was doing it. Just always being busy. Yep. Cool. And then, so that progressed into you wanting to start your own called Fenders, you said? Yeah. So eventually at the end, so this was, I guess it'd be 13 years ago. Uh, that was my final goal was, uh, was going to be a bar, bar restaurant called Fenders Tex-Mex and Grill. It's going to be in St. Thomas. And uh, we had everything laid out. We had the, the design laid. We had the POS machines ready to order, the tables, everything. And then unfortunately, it just came down to the last minute and it didn't work out. So in a lot of ways, I'm very thankful it didn't work out because as much as I'd love to run a restaurant and a bar, it's just like a band. When you're married, you're married to your restaurant and your family's your mistress. And uh, I'm kind of glad it didn't happen because I got to really come back and enjoy my family a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way to put it. And so you transition from uh, wanting to start Fender's Tex-Mex. And is did you say that's when you went to Norma Jean's? No, no, no. That's actually, this. the Fender's was after Norma's. It was after I, oh, after I okay. left Helping Hands. So I left Helping Hands. Um, we sold the business. Uh, my mom's retired. She's doing fantastic. Uh, in her 80s and still running around better than and faster than anyone else can. Um, and then I went to Norma Jean's for Jonathan since I, I booked the nights, indie nights there. And I was always playing there. And everyone thought I basically lived there that uh, he uh, asked me to go and manage the Tilsonburg Norma Jean's when it opened. Um, my plan was to start my own after that. And uh, so I left Norma's and was ready to start my own. It fell through. And um, I said, when a door closes, something else opens. And that's when Doug called me to get into the sales side. Gotcha. I apologize for going all around here. I'm just trying to oh. get the timelines here and, and see like what led to what. And uh, yeah, the man that does so much, it's hard to keep up with him. Nothing really leads to anything. It's all about the opportunities at the moment and uh, they'll, they'll change quickly. Gotcha. So then you get the opportunity to go work at uh, Jerry's Volvo Trucks. Is that what it's called? Yeah, Jerry's Truck Center here in London. Jerry's Truck Center. And he didn't want to hire you. And no. yet you went in there and you were able to sell him on hiring you. And he probably doesn't regret it. No, and like I said, uh, Doug, who is now one of the owners, uh, Jerry, who is Jerry's Truck Center. Uh, Jerry passed away of ALS uh, years back, um, but he was such an amazing person. And uh, his first initial reaction to me was, no, he has no experience selling trucks. And this is big rigs. This is expensive equipment. Um, Doug convinced him to have the interview that Volvo set out. And I said, two hours later, I just, it was just how much I really enjoyed researching the company and found out where they were moving, what they were doing, what I liked. And the, I think it was the, the connection I have with people. And I think Jerry saw that and he told Doug that, uh, yeah, give him a shot. And um, after that, I asked for a bigger salary. Jerry told me what I was going to get and that was it. And I said, okay, thank you very much. Um, and then started to learn, learn the industry. Uh, they, uh, the first stuff I started selling was a, a highway tractor, but then I asked Doug, I said, what do you have the most trouble selling in Volvo? And he said, dump trucks. So I said, perfect. That's what I'll do. And that's what I did. I went out and I created, if you look around London and Southwestern Ontario, the Volvo dump trucks driving around was because of Doug and I, and, uh, I did it by going up and knocking on the door of a dump truck guy and say, Hey, I want to sell trucks to you. What do you need to know? What do you need about your truck? What do you like? Teach me. I don't know anything. 
And I just went out and asked for everybody who'd been driving them for their help. And that gave me the exact lesson I needed to know how to sell them. Wow. Okay. So you approached your, essentially your target audience to learn what, like how you can communicate the value to them. Is that one? Yeah. I asked, I asked them for help and they're all driving other brands. They're driving Peterbilt's and Kenworth's and, and Freightliners and internationals. And, um, I just said, I want to know what to do. So I, I used to go out uh, when I first started, I would ask them, can I come for a ride along? So I'd drive around with them for half a day, watch them do it, ask them what they like about what they do, what they don't like about their truck, what they love about their truck, all those different things that what could be better, what could be worse. And we just built it up, built it up. And we slowly, but surely got into the market and uh, we, we made it work, but it's all because I asked, that was it. That was, that was my only thing that I wanted to do was ask them, be honest and find out what it is you need and teach me, help me. Now the whole, I'm new to this. Can you help me only lasts for so long? You can't quite do that at your seventh year. <laughs> um, but it's a great way to get in the door and talk to people and, and learn what you need to learn. So that's, that's how I did it. So these people, you didn't, you had never talked to them before. You just called them up so and literally knocked on their knocked on the door they were doing construction in our in our uh, area where the office is and he was parked having his lunch and the the first guy they called him jungle jim he was in a big big old peterbilt and uh i just went up and i knocked on his door and stood on his step and said hey i'm pete i want to sell these trucks can you teach me and it was great he actually got me his company that he worked for um was the first demo we got into london they were the first people to use it for me and like i said it was it was nice when you ask people to help uh, they really tend to want to help you and as long as you listen and learn from it it'll help you a lot yeah absolutely so what um what were a couple of the uh, things that stood out to you like when you're asking these guys what do you like about your truck or you know, can you teach me some things? Was there one or two things that you saw quite frequently or you heard quite frequently from them? Or yeah. um, did they all kind of have their own different perspectives on things? Most of the time, they all had the same thing. They were passionate about what they do. They were truck drivers. They were truckers. They were, you know, gravel guys. Um, they were proud of their trucks. They had the, the classic trucks and they were proud of the work they did. And that was the biggest thing that came across is they were proud, but they wanted to be comfortable. And mm -hmm. they let me know on the things that aren't comfortable inside a cab of their trucks. And they let me know that they're older now and they can't reach the bottom step as well. So what can we do? Um, but the biggest thing is all of them were very, very proud of what they did. They were, they were all extremely proud that this is what they did every day. And they were happy to show it to me and how to go through it. So that's what I took away. And that's what I tried to build into the way we would sell them. Isn't so much about here's what our product can do for you because of this, this, and this. Our product does all this, but this is how you're going to feel when you're doing it. And this is how I want you to feel. This is how you feel now. I want to make that better. Um, it's, it's still buying a car, buying a truck. It's still an emotional purchase most of the time because you have to want it, not just need it. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And the fact that you're able to go for ride alongs too, it really speaks to your ability to make people comfortable with you. The biggest thing was, is my thought and it's still to this day is I know what every single truck on the market drives like, feels like, and sounds like, because I go in all of them. So when a customer comes in looking for a new truck and they say they like this brand, I understand why. And I can give them recommendations. I know some people don't want to buy a Volvo from me. I will help them buy what they want to buy. I'll, I'll give them advice on the new Peterbilt with the new engine. Um, you have to know what everybody else is doing in your sector to understand why yours might be different. So I've, I've always loved doing that and it 
having them take me along to ride in their cabs with them has been great. And I've got my DZ license now, so now I get to drive all of them too anytime I want. Oh, wow. <laughs> What's it like driving one of those machines? Uh, you know what? We've got the iShift, which is an automated manual transmission, so it's an automatic. Um, but it's really cool because you think you're in a pickup truck and you're sitting above everybody and you feel good. Then you get in one of these trucks and you're really above everyone. And uh, knowing that you've got 80,000 pounds in there, it really does give you a, a different sense of you do have to be more careful, but it is a great feeling driving truck. That's, there's a reason kids love fire trucks and everybody loves trucks. It's because when you get in them, you feel like you're something different. Like it's just, you're, you're looking at, the road has never looked the same to you because you're five feet above what you normally see. So it's actually really yeah. cool. Wow. That's amazing. So, so you get into, uh, into the truck world and you're knocking on doors, going for rides. Was there anything that you found over the years that you do better than your competition? Like, is that, is that your competitive edge or is there another piece of the ingredient for you? Um, for me, if I were to look at what I do better than maybe some of the other sales guys or what the other brands do is I connect with people. I make it a priority to know who you are, to, to, to understand why you're doing something. And I really just, I love people. So what I've done is we've set up going to truck shows. We've got a, an event trailer that we go to and we, we stock up the fridge and the first rule I said to one of the guys who was with me on the first day that we went to a truck show was we're not selling anything today. And they went, what? I said, no, you are here to talk to them about what they like, hang out with them, have a drink, have a beer. And if they ask you questions, sure, answer them. But other than that, we are here just to enjoy them, enjoy the trucks, enjoy what they like and become their friend and enjoy what you do. And I've always looked at the same thing. It's, it's, it's people are people. You have to take care of them. I call my customers, my clients, because as long as I work for Jerry's truck center, I still work for them. My job is to make sure they have the best thing that they have and they need. So that's, that's my edge is I put events together to show appreciation to them. Um, we did a, a steak dinner every year for the vocational guys, the guys who bought dump trucks. Um, we did a chop steakhouse and it was, it was great. We we're the only ones who ever do that, but it built a community. I got to introduce them to other owner operators, other companies uh, who they're normally competitors with, but other people they may not have met before. We had the uh, vocational uh, manager for North America fly in every year from Greensboro for it. With the vice president of Volvo trucks, uh, Canada come out and uh, the first time somebody asked me, how did, how did you get Andy Hansen, the, the vocational manager for North America? And I said, I asked. And that was it. I just, I asked. He could have said no, but he didn't. Um, and those are the things I think is the only difference between me and the other guys. I really try to care about the person in front of me. Wow. The uh, community, building a community. Yep. It's, it's, I say it's smart, but it's also like, that's just who you are, right? Like when you look back at, um, you know, working at Norma Jeans and, and with your music career and whatnot, like you, you look at the music world and it's all about community. Yep. So it's fascinating that to be for you to be able to go in there and build those like that kind of community in that industry is is pretty wild. I, I honestly i I think the reason I've always been drawn to different communities is because I love a community. I think we're all better off as a team. We're all better off when we work together, and uh, it's neat how many people don't feel that way or recognize it or, or work towards it. But 
that's why I said I'm, I'm, I'm not a salesman salesman. I'm not going to upsell you on something you don't need. Um, I tell people when I'm not going to sell them a truck because it's not the right one for them. Uh, or right now with the costs of everything and the costs of fuel and the cost of trucks have gone up and the hourly rates haven't been there. I've had more conversations telling people that now is not the time to buy a truck. Come back and see me in a couple of years. Um, and I think that goes a long way because you're not just the sales guy who's trying to sell them something. Uh, you actually understand why they're there and, and, and what to do. And it's very disarming when a sales guy tells you he doesn't want to sell you something. It, it, it really takes yeah. the person back a little. Yeah, that's, that is a really good way of building trust. Just, you know, <laughs> being a, a genuine human being, right? Weird, isn't it? <laughs> it's funny because the more, the more books that I read and, uh, you know, things that I listen to, it's just, it reassures that notion of, um, have you ever read the book, The Go-Giver? No, I have not read that one. So this book, it's written by Bob Berg and uh, John Mann, I think is the name. And it's essentially just a book about being a good human being and, um, it, it would fall right in line with your philosophy. You would read it and be like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yes, you're correct. <laughs> that's a truth. And the more and more that I, that I read and I dive into, um, you know, personal development and, and everything in that space, it's just when it comes to sales, the best way to be the best salesman is really to be a genuine human being and to know that you're going to um that you're there to serve and not just to say that not just to talk the talk but to walk the walk right and that is that is the challenge because you have a lot of guys who are great with 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 sound clips and that's really what our environment with 30 second video clips are it's what can you say as a sound bite and you don't always believe it. The best is when you say it, they don't believe it, then you show them and they're taken back that you actually did what you said. And it's, yeah. uh, like I said, it's, 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 it's interesting. It goes right back to, you're talking about books, going back to how to influence and win friends. I mean, if you go all the way back to the oldest sales training, if you read that entire thing, it's about being genuine and wanting to help someone. Yeah. Absolutely. Which I think is a really good thing to have, not just in like the sales world, but reading that book by Dale Carnegie, it's, it's like, I guess, kind of a class that people should have got in high school and never did, right? Like how to be a good person. Um, you would think should be, is it sounds kind of cliche, but Sometimes you need a refresher or just to learn how, uh, what makes other people tick so that, you know, you can, you can connect with them again with no agenda, just being a genuine human being and learning about them and, and to be able to have conversations that way. And, you know, now we live in a society that is so uh, connected technologically but so disconnected as, you know, human beings. Yeah. We're, we're all there to congratulate and put a like and a love on somebody who's celebrating something, you know, but as soon as we press it and we scroll, we've forgotten about it in, in three minutes. So it's, it's, it's teaching yourself to remember that that person just graduated. So the next time you see them in real life, you can say, congratulations. Now I'm not perfect. I still, Congratulations, write my thing, scroll, and I forget. Um, but I really try to remember on the people who are in my community and uh, in my little tribe that I make sure that we, uh, we celebrate the, the things that they go through in life. Hey, one quick podcast recommendation here before we get back to the show. I highly suggest checking out Sales Chatter. They talk about sales, logistics, personal growth, have some really cool guests on, and they're just great guys to listen to. 
So definitely check out Sales Chatter on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. All right, back to the show. Absolutely. On that note, with how your your career has been, what have been the biggest challenges that you've faced so far and how have you approached them or, or overcome them? Um, the biggest challenges I had, restaurants wasn't hard for me because I grew up at 13 years old in a restaurant. Healthcare wasn't difficult for me because I was in a nursing home since I was five years old visiting people. Um, this business, selling trucks, was challenging for me. It was very hard. Um, actually, I'll, I'll bring it back to what was hard. is My, my first year, I, I took business marketing at Fanshawe, and uh, I decided I wanted to not do helping hands, and I was going to get a job. So I, my first job was an assistant manager at Tip Top Tailors. I was in Masonville Mall, and I struggled with accounting through high school. I failed it three times in high school, twice in college, finally got through it. And I was a system manager working hard. And it was my manager who said to me, are you dyslexic? And I went, uh, no. He says, well, I've been looking at your numbers at the end of the night and every number has been wrong. So I started changing them around and playing them. I started getting them. So I went and figured out and turns out, yep, I'm dyslexic with numbers and letters. So that was a big challenge. Everything else I could get around with, with just talking to people and figuring stuff out. Um, when it came time for leaving the music scene and leaving the bar scene um, and really focus on the family and doing the sales job, I had I struggled with, with uh, depression and anxiety. Um, so I went to my doctor and got a little bit of help and then I started to learn and focus because Building trucks, you have to know codes, know numbers, know those things. You have to be able to read them. So through those years, I taught myself how to slow down a little bit, focus hard, but you still get things backwards, especially when it's numbers and letters. Um, so that was the biggest thing for me to overcome was being able to focus well enough to do it and feel good about what I was doing, not feeling like I'm making mistakes. So um, I got through it. Um, made it through. I had to learn a whole new world that I wasn't aware of. Um, that part was great because I got to go and knock on a window and ask somebody what they like about it. So I got to learn that world. The inside world was sitting down on the computer and, and building the truck and, and doing those things. Um, so yeah, I, I, I got through it. It was good. Like I said, my, my family was there and a lot of nights that I worked late. Um, I, I don't take vacations. I love to be busy. I love to work. So for the first eight years, the, my owner, the, my boss, Doug, him and I would be working till seven, eight o'clock at night. And it was great. I had a great time, but that was the time that I needed to be able to do it. Um, it wasn't until um, a year and a half ago that uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD. Obvious to so many people, but I didn't know. And it made so much more sense when you look back and go through your life and realize, oh, there you go. Uh, so now I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on medication for it and it's fantastic. Um, just that little extra that you didn't realize you, you needed is there. So I'm excited to see where, where I keep going now with, uh, with the extra help that's out there. Absolutely. That's, uh, I'm kind of speechless. Like, to deal with, I, like, I, I, I don't have dyslexia, but just hearing people talk and share their experiences with it is, it's even more uh, celebratory learning what, about what you're doing, um, like, outside of the sales thing, like screenwriting, and uh, I assume writing music as well yeah. and just you know all that is it, that can be difficult enough but when you throw in dys dyslexia um it's just you must feel even more proud 
going through that? Like, well, I, I still can't spell to save my life. Um, but there's so many programs now that, that help us out there. What I think being dyslexic really did for me was it able, enabled me to be a great storyteller. I wasn't necessarily the best at writing it down or reading about it because it would be frustrating, but it allowed me to be a storyteller. I learn visually, I learn audibly. Um, and when I do things, I don't focus it on what I'm going to write to you. I do what I'm going to tell you. And I think it really gave me that ability to, to enjoy storytelling. And when you tell a story, people remember a story over a fact. And I think part of, after I found out I was dyslexic, then after I found out I was ADHD, like oh, that makes so much more sense now because that's how I learn. So I just used the easiest way I learned to teach other people and to talk to other people and to sell things to other people and to help them buy what they want. Um, but yeah, I think it all really does come from that. Uh, I still, like I said, I still can't spell. My, my, all my kids spell better than me. And I'm from 12 years old to 22. Uh, they're brilliant, but uh, they still know they don't come to dad for help with spelling or math. <laughs> now, here's a question for you. Because I've heard it said that uh, if you were to look at, say, a blind man, their hearing is just impeccable. Like, they can hear sounds that the average person couldn't even fathom. But it's because they don't have, uh, I guess, their vision distracting them in a way that they're able to concentrate so much more with their hearing. I wonder if that is similar to having dyslexia. You, you mentioned like, you know, storytelling and more, um, it's more conversational. And so in a way, I wonder if, if there's, um, if it almost gives you a, 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 an edge with your speaking, having dyslexia, what, what's your thoughts on that? I don't think it's, I wouldn't disagree. I'd say depending on how you take it and what your takeaways from it is, um, when, a, when a deaf person, a blind person can hear better, it's because they don't have their eyes to rely on to see the things that they're not hearing. So they have to focus. Um, in that regard, for me, storytelling, yeah, I would say a lot of it was because if I couldn't spell it, I had to say it. So it was, and, or I had to choose. I mean, I mean, there's an old joke that I couldn't spell one word. So I wrote a new paragraph just to say the word that I wanted. Um, it, it always helps you explain things, but um, I would, I would say that those things go hand in hand. Um, it, it's also just what you want to do with it. It might also be the same thing for somebody that they, they chose not to because they couldn't do it one way and they just chose not to. I just chose to find a way that I had to do it. And, and I had to, I worked with seniors. I worked with Alzheimer's and stroke when I was 15. You have to find a way to listen and communicate. And I had no other choice. I'm just wow. glad they didn't make me write at all. Yeah. Wow. So then when it comes to your screenwriting, do you, do you envision these, uh, uh, I guess these ideas and then do you speak them out? Um, to be translated into, into text or how to, how does that no. work for you? Um, I type them out. I type out all my ideas. So I'll, I'll, I'll get an idea for, for a movie. And once, like I said, I've learned the structure, I put it in, everything gets typed. Um, and I've got the normal spell check. And then I've got the, the new one that's out there that gives a nice big red line underneath. Um, so I type it all. Um, I don't, I use a lot of voice to text on cell phones. Um, but when I'm writing, I don't use voice to text. It, it's weird because it's in my head. But if I start doing voice to text, it comes out too fast and I lose where I was going. So when I type it, 
it gives me that moment to rethink of everything that I'm putting in for the story. So I have to really think about where it goes. I have to really think about what the character wants. Um, so I, I find it's the opposite. So when I'm, when I'm doing screenplays and writing, uh, it, it is, it has to come out through the, through the fingers. Now I will say I do record ideas, voice to text, if I got an idea, but when it comes to writing, um, I use final draft and I just type it on the screen. Uh, because it, it, it allows my brain to slow down enough to really become the person I'm writing. That makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, I guess twofold. Two different ideas going through my head right now. Um, first, as you first mentioned about typing it out and really having to think about, you know, what the character wants and, and, what's going on in the scene. Um, it just reminded me of my experiences taking a uh, speech that I gave and converting it into text and then looking at that compared to what I want it to say and how I would write it. And it's completely different. And there's that magic that happens when you're able to sit there and really think about what you want to say as compared to spitting out words on a, um, you know, at a certain rate. Yep. So I think I have a better understanding of, of what you're dealing with now with, you know, just ne needing to take a second and just really think, pause and reflection and then typing yep. it up. Cool. And then That's on cool. the 15th draft, it starts to look good. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard um, Neil Strauss. Do you, have, do you know who that is? I do know the name. He's uh, so he, he wrote a few um, rock biographies. Like he wrote the dirt by Motley or like the Motley yes. Crue story. Yep. I did uh, listen he, to that. He also wrote, uh, what was it? Long hard road out of hell or Marilyn Manson. And I think there were six altogether. He's also wrote the game, like the uh, the pickup artist story. His writing, I find, I, I've always been captivated by his writing. And I remember reading The Dirt and just being very, like, it just connected on me on, on a different level. And then reading the game and feeling that same connection. And then afterwards realizing it's the same author. I thought that was pretty neat. Well, you, 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 you found his style and that you connected with the way he flowed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I totally forget where I was going with that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I apologize. <laughs> I, cut, I cut you off there for it. No, no, that's, that's totally fine. Um, but I guess getting into that, uh, what, what, would, what did you say before this? Um, that writing was, I, I just take the time to understand who the character is and I have to do it with typing. So if I speak, I speak too fast and I just go off on a tangent. But when I have to focus on typing, I can let the character grow and develop and, and, and become what it needs to be by taking that extra little bit of time to think about it. Gotcha. <clears throat> Pardon me. Back to me, but that's okay. anyways, I may have said something um, else. You definitely did. And I'm sure when I listen to this back, I'll be like, I know exactly what I wanted to say there. Uh, that's totally fine. though. It wasn't meant to be <laughs> with, with your, uh, with your screenwriting. When did you say you first started into that? Um, that would have been what, 2023 now, end of 2023. This would have been 2021. So it's just been two, two and a half years, two years. Um, and yeah, it was, I, uh, yeah, it was, fan it was actually, it was fantastic. Um, because the very first one I wrote is a, is a, is a screenplay called uh, The Good Neighbor. And it was just going to be a short film that I wanted to do. And I was on to ask Brent to, to do it with me and we never got around to it. So, Brent said something to me, says a short should be 10 minutes. 
because if you get to 20, 25 minutes, you might as well make it a feature. So I started writing it and it was getting longer than that. So I don't know, I'll just, I'll just make it a feature. And I had no idea how to write a feature film. I just thought everything is centered. And every time somebody speaks, you have to put quotations around the words that they're saying, because that's what you saw in books if they're doing it. So I wrote the first really, really bad draft, all center bolded right through and quotes around what everybody says. In case you're wondering, that is not how you do it. But it was great to, to learn that and, and put that out that way and then realized I enjoyed it. So I looked and I learned how to do it. And I went and found YouTube and podcasts and, and, and tutorials and, and then just went, oh, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. So then, of course, I would take the first little bit that I learned and I'd redo it all. Then I'd go back and learn a little bit more and be like, okay, I got to redo it all again. Um, cause I'm not necessarily the one who's going to sit and be patient till the very end to learn everything. I get an idea and I just have to run with it. So after two and a half years, I've got, uh, three features completed, uh, four, sorry, four features completed, uh, a short film written, a uh, pilot episode of a TV show. Um, and I've got like three other ones that I'm working on occasionally as I go back to it. But, uh, it's uh yeah it was it's only been only been a few years and the nice thing is since it's only been a few years the last year in september we just finished the full draft of a night with nathan and we finished filming a night with nathan at the beginning of august so it was just under a year from finishing the first draft to finishing the last day of shooting the film it was one year and uh, that apparently isn't something that happens all the time. So we're uh, we're very fortunate, very very lucky that we we were able to to do that, and the movie just came together, and it was like I said, it worked great. Wow, it's amazing what you can find on on YouTube and on the internet. It's like the things you can learn out there is incredible. Yep, every, every night I come home, uh, so I'm late, eleven o'clock on. It's I put on YouTube and I go to the next thing that I want to learn something or, or pick up on and until I doze off on the couch and that's it just, there's, there's always something. That's what I do love about YouTube. I don't use YouTube for anything really other than actually I, I use it for catching up on Seth Meyers and the other ones, but mostly it's yep. just learning stuff. <laughs> yeah. Every once in a while you need a break, right? I do remember what I was going to say previously too, when you were talking okay. about when you made the uh, you made your first draft there, and you had uh, some ideas in mind of how things are supposed to look, and then found out it wasn't. Uh, what I was going to say with the Neil Strauss thing is, he said in in an interview either with Tim Ferriss or uh, someone else, he said the first draft is only for your eyes. So you go and you write everything that you've ever wanted to written, and it could be a thousand pages by the end, uh, at the end of the first draft. And don't feel embarrassed about writing down anything because it's only for your eyes only. And then somewhere at the end of that is your story. You just got to go through and start compiling it. Yep. So that's what, I, that's what I was getting at with that. Um, and that's ex that's exactly right too. The other thing that I was going to say uh, or add to what you said is when you talked about the uh, you know going to YouTube and learning a little bit and then applying it, it's kind of that. Um, I'm trying to think. Of, there's an old saying that goes: uh, if you want something in life, you have to be willing to take that first step. And if you take the first step, then, uh, you know, life takes a step towards you. But if you yeah. don't step, then life won't step. And stay where you, you might. Are. Yeah. And you might, you might have no clue on how to go from, you know, where you are to the top of the mountain. But if you take that first step, 
or you start to climb just a little little ways, all of a sudden you uncover something that you couldn't see from the bottom. But now that you're on the journey, you're like, oh yeah, that's that's the next thing I got to learn or that's the next thing that I got to look out for or, or whatever it is. It's just, unless you're on the journey, you'll never discover that or you'll never see the next step in in front of you. No, and I agree. I think it's the thing is if you don't start moving, everything looks the same. But every time you take two steps, your perception is different because you're in a new spot of your life. You've moved forward. Now everything looks different. If you stay where you are, everything looks the same. Take a step forward. Everything looks different. Takes 10 steps forward and it looks way different than it was. Take 20 steps forward and you forget what it used to look like 20 steps ago. And I think that's the, that's the nice thing about just putting yourself out there to do something. And sometimes you, you learn something that you realize you don't like it. And that's fantastic because you didn't know that either. You thought you would. So, no, I agree. And that is also something that still you struggle with sometimes. Do you want to change? Do you want to take that step? Because for some people, it's, it's frightening. Yeah. Yeah. You need that um, that motivating factor that drives you, whether it's having a goal that that pulls you into the future or you're just sick and tired of where you are and it's time to change it, whatever it is it's you need that driving factor to to push you you know when um we, we were talking off camera about some things that that uh you know if you lose your motivation for something um and you're trying to find that that drive again it can be challenging and I lost my drive for a couple of years and just recently has come back. And it's, you know, maybe that's a, maybe that's a, a, a sign of, you know, maybe you just need a break. Maybe you just need to, to, you know, take a moment to rest and to set some new goals. Maybe, yep. you know, whatever it is, there's, something there to help pull you in to the future and, um, and I, go on I, was say, I agree with you i think it there is some times where you just have to step back and and take a break but there's something to be said about you can't wait for motivation do what you want to do and then it's almost like you'll find your motivation while you do it but there is times where you just need to stop you need to reset because Whatever you've done in your brain, whatever you've put yourself through, how many thoughts you've got going is just too much. And you're no good to anybody else when you can't figure out what it is. So take that break. If your motivation disappears, it's okay. As long as you want that, it'll come back. So I agree 100%. Sometimes you just have to get off the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you have no idea like what why it dissipates or why it comes and goes. But if you have that goal in mind, you're like, yeah, I, that is what I want. Then again, as long as you're taking those steps forward, just making progress is really, really the name of the game. See, having goals are fantastic. I don't do a, a goal sheet. I don't, I, I should because of who I am, I really should make a list every day. And the thought of making a list is painful to me. So I find a reason not to make a list every day. I think I can remember it in my head and I don't. But you always need to have that goal. And as long as you have that goal, you've got something to look forward to. The trick is having the goal and being brave enough to take the first step towards it. And that's where a lot of people, I think, struggle when they feel like they're they're just stuck but those people they don't know what they need that one little thing to just change it one day that one little thing in their head's just gonna change it could it be it could be their kid it could be their spouse it, it could be their boss it could be a car that drives by but as long as you have a goal there's something you can go towards and i always do try to have goals for it even if i'm not ready to put my foot forward but I still have that goal. It's still there. Yeah. 
Yeah. I've, um, something that I've discovered over the last couple of years, I'd, I'd say, or last year, really, um, as it relates to, to goals or to going through challenges, sometimes, you know, you try to put perspective on, on things, whatever it is, if it's good or bad. Usually if, if there's something bad that happens, people are usually asking like, well, why, why is this happening to me? Or why does this always happen to me? Or like, they're trying to find the meaning in it. Right. And unless there's meaning to it, then it's just, it's frustrating because you don't know why. And something that I've, I've grasped onto is just like, well, maybe you, you had mentioned there's, it, there might be one thing that, that you got to learn or, or one thing to help you moving forward. And it's like, well, maybe the challenges that you face, maybe they're not even for you. Maybe you're going through something or you have to struggle through something so that someone else doesn't have to, because maybe you'll come into contact with them and you'll be able to help them move past that. And, and I've always thought that that's pretty motivating in, in amongst itself. Actually, that is extremely motivating because you don't take what's bad happening to you or good happening to you and asking why. You're just realizing it's happening, so I'm going to get through it. The nice thing is, is you're exactly right. You have no idea who you're going to meet tomorrow that your ability to get over smoking, um, exercising, losing weight, um, uh, getting through the grief of a family member passing away, getting through those stages of your life that feel hard, the person you meet tomorrow may just need a five minute conversation with you to see that you've done it as well. And that's it. So as long as you can get through it, you can always help somebody else, even if you don't mean to help them. Just by getting through it, you will help the next person. So I yeah. agree 100%. Look, look at what you shared, like before we got on here with your journey, you said you had a friend reach out and say, because of you, I'm starting to, to, you know, take care of myself. And yeah, like, I think that's, it's inspiring. And when you look at it, like you might personally might not think that it's a big deal. You're like, Oh, that's great. That's great that you're doing it. But if you look at your journey, like, I, am, am I able to share your, your journey? Cause I think it's freaking yeah. incredible what you did. This guy dropped a hundred pounds uh, over the course of a year. Is that? Yep. That was a year. hundred pounds. And then a friend of his, reached out the other day to say, because of, because of you, I'm starting to, you know, go on my own journey and, and look after myself now. And losing a hundred pounds is no easy feat. Like that's just another thing on, on, you know, another thing that you're tackling. <laughs> well, and, and as I said, the, the beauty about him starting it, and it might go back to what you're saying is I, after the hundred pounds, I, I hit a plateau. I, I, I couldn't, couldn't find any way to lose anymore. So I just said, I'm just going to have a reset. I'm going to let my body reset itself. And well, unfortunately, uh, chips and ice cream and everything else come into play a lot more and less activity. And I've gained like 28 pounds back. And right when he called me to tell me that he said, you know what? You're right. This walking thing is great. You, me walking every morning and every night has helped me drop like 18 pounds. I'm feeling better. His call came at the perfect time because I needed that little extra motivation to get back to doing what I was doing before. So if he didn't call me to tell me that, it wouldn't have given me that extra little boost and keep it in my head that, yeah, you got to do this. You can do it. You just showed it works for him. It works for you. You did it. So get back and do it. So it's, it's kind of interesting when you, when you brought it up that way that, yeah, he took it as inspiration to go and try it and do it. And 
I stopped doing it. And when he called to tell me that he did it, it gave me a little more of a boost to, to go and do it. So yeah, it always works when somebody does something positive. <laughs> Absolutely. And I didn't know that it was 18 pounds that this guy's lost already. Yeah. It's been like, uh, two months, month and a half from walking. He just, he just let me know it's 18 pounds that he's lost. And he's, uh, because I think he said that he laughed because it's the morning time that he would normally sleep. He gets up and does an hour. And then at night he does an hour and he's somebody who can go to bed a bit earlier. I'm not the guy who goes to bed early. So he went and walked instead of eating and sitting, watching TV. And it just tenfold. So the walking was great, but he was also eating less um, of the stuff he didn't need. And then he had more energy after he walked in the morning. So he had his coffee and just went to work. So it was all of those little things that it compounded and it, it helped him drop 18 pounds really, really quick. You might have saved this guy's life. He, he's, he was not a big, he wasn't as big as me. I was like 320 pounds. He was just a guy who had his big beard and he just realized that he was starting to get a little too big again. So it's, uh, I would, I'd, I'd like to say that uh, I helped him feel a bit better about himself, but uh, he was, he was no, oh, he was nowhere near being, uh, being too big, but, uh, and I guess I've got a, I've got a standard now. I look at me and go just how big I was. And I think anybody under that's probably doing okay. So I'm a, I might be a little biased on somebody who weighs 240 pounds trying to get down to 220. I'm like, you look great at 240. Good job, bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can understand that. But I, I mean, even just him having that habit will be so beneficial. If he didn't lose, if it was five pounds, but he's yeah. cutting out the junk and, you know, getting more exercise in, going for walks, like, it's huge. You compound that over a year or two. You can lose a hundred pounds. Exactly. <laughs> See, you gotta, you gotta get back out there and I do. Keep I motivating. gotta get doing that. You're, you're now, and you know, you are now an inspiration to at least one other person. So there you go. I never thought of that before. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have, do you have kids? I do. I have four kids. I am um, 22, 19, 17, and 12. Actually, it'll be, sorry, it'll, this, by the end of this year, it'll be 23, 20, uh, 17, and 12. So, yep. Uh, my, my oldest daughter is fantastic. She's, she's uh, living with her boyfriend and uh, she's going back to teacher's college this year. Uh, her boyfriend is um, taking his master's in uh, I'm sorry, his, uh, his uh, doctorate in education. He's already got his master's in history. And so he's getting his uh, PhD. Is that his? Yeah, PhD in, in education. Uh, my son's at Fanshawe taking uh, construction renovation. He's doing fantastic. My daughter's in 12th grade of high school. She wants to be a flight attendant or anything else that she might like to do. And my, my youngest son, he's, he's going to be 12 and just got into soccer and yeah, he's just, I, I have, I have a fantastic family and my, my wife's great. So it's, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fortunate guy. There's the reason I stopped playing music for, for like 11 years yeah. to focus on those people who really, really mattered. Yeah. And what I'm going to say is that, so you have four other people who look up to you. And I, I would imagine if you were to ask them, like how inspiring it was to see you drop a hundred pounds, that might give you the motivation that you need to get back out there. And then it, it really does actually just you saying that reminds me of when they could hug me and put their arms all around me. And so, yeah. That is a, that is good. Awesome. Hey, if you're struggling with trying to develop a more positive mindset, 
One book I would recommend checking out would be John Maxwell's Sometimes You Win, Sometimes You Learn. It's one of those books that changes the perspective on failures and when you lose and all the good things that you can take away from every experience. So that's Sometimes You Win, Sometimes You Learn by John Maxwell. Check it out. All right, let's get back to the show. We have not got a chance to talk about your music, uh, so I will put it out there. What's uh, what have you got going on in the in the music world? Right now, we are just uh, Ken Ross, uh, Jamie Sutherland, and myself. Uh, that was the original, other than the vocalist Craig Turner, who's in uh, BC now. We got back together, and we're three older guys. Uh, Ken's more positive. I say I'm pushing 50 and he's pulling 40, but um, uh, we're, we're playing and we're just doing some covers. We're getting together once a week and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been great just being able to reconnect one with, with the people who you started your journey with um, and just be able to play drums. Uh, there's another band out of Strathroy called Vibe, Teddy Lane and Scott and Cal. They're awesome. They're, uh, I play with them as well. Um, they're more of the, the live rock setting where what Jamie, Ken and I are doing is a little more corporate, a little more laid back. Uh, we don't want to be out till two in the morning. You know, we'll go do an afternoon gig, uh, some corporate stuff. But um, it's just been great getting back to play. And actually, with the, that brings back to the movie. We were able to incorporate in this movie a lot of songs from Tommy Rot. And since there were so many different versions, we can use so many different songs that don't sound the same. So it's been, been fantastic. So we're, we're going to put a, probably put a little uh, concert together um, as a fundraiser for the film. And uh, we actually are working with Laura Gagnon, who is a great local artist. And she's uh, an actress in the movie as well. So we are going to be using one of her songs in the scene she's in. And on the 13th, we're going out to uh, Whiskey Rocks in St. Thomas to film a video for her. So we're gonna film the video, blend it with the movie and have Brent and I in the video as well. So we're going like a throw right back to the nineties and we're gonna have a, a soundtrack and a music video that goes with the movie. So we're, uh, we're, we're having fun with it. That's cool that you're able to combine these different things. Like the, yeah. it kind of goes hand in hand, but it's amazing like just to be able to do those different uh, aspects. Um, yeah, it's been fantastic. So lastly, well, I guess second last question. Uh, where can people check out the film? In uh, You said it's coming out in January? Uh, January, we're hoping that it's going to be, it'll be done so we can send to uh, film festivals. So we won't have a release date for the public as of yet, but we are hoping to get through post-production, all editing and everything done by January so we can put it out to film festivals. Um, probably do a couple private screenings uh, of it to see where it sits. Um, I'm hoping by end of next summer, we'll be on streaming platforms. Um, but right now, people can go on to Tubi and look up Seeking Oblivion, which was the first movie that Brent Barrett wrote. And uh, it was the first opportunity I had to star in it. I play a sleazy bar manager. So that was uh, that was interesting. Half the time, I'm not sure if people say, yeah, you fit the role well, or I don't know. But <laughs> either way, it was, it was my first experience on film. And you can go watch it on Tubi. Just look up Seeking Oblivion. And then, uh, yeah, we're hoping that by, uh, by summer... Uh, a night with Nathan will be out. Um, yeah, it's just a lot more work. I now I have to learn more about editing and understanding and scoring, and because uh, I don't just want to give it off to people, I'd like to learn how to do it myself. So it's a, it's going to be a challenge. But Brent has already been through it once. He uh, he wrote and directed and edited a great film first. So we're using everything that we he learned and we learned on that first movie to make this one even better. Amazing. And I can put the, uh, the link in the show notes so that people can click on it and, and check it out. Yeah. I, I have not got a chance to get too far into it, but <laughs> definitely will be checking it out. 
There you go. Um, and then as far as uh, Tommy Rot, uh, what is it? Whiskey Whiskey Lanes was that the song? Whiskey Lane is uh, Whiskey Lane. It's it. It, it, it's it's oh, the whiskey rocks was the bar we were in but whiskey lane from tommy rod is that was a song that uh, howie and i came up with and it's awesome it's like a country southern rocker and it it's uh, it's about going to a bar <laughs> where where everybody knows you and uh sometimes you have to leave so it's uh it's like i said there's there's so much difference in all the different tommy rod stuff we did but that is one of my favorite songs yeah yeah i that was the first song that i listened to and and I was like, yep, I'm putting this on my playlist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. And uh, last question for you. Um, then I'll let you get back to uh, get back to work. Um, yeah. Do you have uh, three books? Could be any genre. Um, doesn't have to be anything specific. But three books that you would recommend that people check out. Um, yeah, actually I do. And, uh, I was, I was saying earlier in this, that, uh, reading is a little more challenging. I, I don't enjoy it as much. I've always wanted to be a reader. Um, so audible is what I use. Um, and it's, it's fantastic. So I still get to enjoy books. I just don't have to sit down and read them. I can do them while I'm driving. Um, the first one keeping with business is, uh, the no bullshit leader. Um, it is fantastic. Um, it's Martin, Martin Moore, uh, Australian, him and his daughter created the business. And, um, he wrote a book called the noble Shit leader based on their podcast and their company they started and uh, a great book. It's very direct. It's, it just lets you have a nice frontline look like the one line was yes, respect before popularity. And I thought that was great for leaders. And the biggest one that I took away was the standard you walk past is the standard you set. And that was something that was in his podcast, in his book. And I, I thought that was fantastic. So I really enjoyed that read. Um, the Nothing Man is a, uh, is a fictional book. It's about a serial killer who, who uh, unfortunately stopped. So fortunately he stopped, but his last victims, uh, the daughter lived and she led her life to find him and bring him out and, and capture him. And she wrote a book about it and he reads the book and it just unfolds that way. So it's really neat to see even the psychology of the child who never let it go and the killer who did. And uh, so it, it, it's kind of neat. Um, and then Green Light by Matthew McConaughey. That was just a, a really good book. It just made you feel good and understand what was happening. Let you say yes to things. Yeah, I I I don't know if I finished that book, but I I know that I'm like pretty far through it. It's he's got a great voice for uh, <laughs> for storytelling that way. And like I said, listening to it, it's him who who narrates it, so it's even better as you're you're sitting there listening to him, and you're just like, oh, it's just, it just makes you feel like you're sitting right next to him, and he's he's so relaxed and laid back uh, when you hear him talk that you can't help but connect with what he was saying. So that's the other side of the audiobooks that I like. You, if you get somebody who's narrating, it's really good. It just takes you one more step into it. Absolutely. That, and that's the version that, uh, like I, I use audible all the time and that's what I was listening to. Like Matthew McConaughey reading his own book. It's amazing. And he does it so well. Yeah. He does indeed. Anyways. Well, Pete, We've got on, I think this is the longest interview <laughs> that I have done so far, but uh, for good reason, like I, you are, you're like Shep Gordon. Do you, do you know who Shep Gordon is? No. Shep Gordon. Uh, he's got a book out called, they call me Supermensch. He's been Alice Cooper's manager for ever. He's yes, I do know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He's lived yes, like I do. three different lives all in one. <laughs> just talking with you, I, I feel like that's kind of the same, uh, the same persona is just like, you're, you've dived, you've dove into all these different areas and you're, you know, facing the challenges and moving past 
and also like you know seeing seeing success with them and and having fun doing it and i think that's amazing that you know just every area seems to be firing on all cylinders for you so um i don't know how you even get any sleep um but yeah i i really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and sharing some some good tips and tricks and and all that and especially the books so um is there is there any last last words you have uh no i just i really appreciate you asking me i was uh i was thankful that i actually was on facebook and i saw your post for your your podcast and i i i really enjoyed listening to to every one of them so um i felt the connection with you listening to even your very first one on your views of people and selling and and uh when you said the words that no one likes to be sold i was hooked because that is that is exactly my philosophy so i uh i like how you were able to at least make me realize that you know even though this is the only real job i'm selling and every job is selling you're always selling something it's either a service or something like that so no i've i've really enjoyed today this has been this has been fantastic and i thank you very much for that and i will continue to enjoy your podcast and, and share it out so i think you i think you've got a I think you've got a good good directive and i think you've got yourself a, a great story to share on what what you've done so i really appreciate being on today well thanks pete and uh where can the listeners find you um right now i will be starting a, a entertainment company called on spec entertainment and promotion company um so eventually that will be up there for people to go to but right now uh, facebook is just pete comry uh, tommy rot uh, is on spotify and then um yeah, I guess that's it because I don't have my on spec entertainment up and running yet. That'll be uh, hopefully before the end of this year, I'll, I'll have that up right. I just have to now learn how to build a website. Um, I'm a lot older than I thought I was. So I, 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 I got it set up three months ago and it's still sitting in its original format of not being launched yet. So that's my next challenge I need to learn. It's, it's all good. If there's one thing that I know about you now is that you're going to make it through. Appreciate it. And once you do get it up, let me know and I can add them, add it to the show, no show notes and just update it. Thank you very much. I will do that for sure. Cool. Well, Pete, thanks again for coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk soon. Sounds good. Going Thank to you. So that's it for another episode of the Promo Minds podcast. I'm your host, Steve Leslie. And uh, today was fun. I got to learn a lot about Pete. And uh, I, it, it blows my mind just, like I said, how much this guy can do. And, you know, on top of he's got a family with four kids. He just lost 100 pounds, like earned the 100 pounds. And... Uh, you know, I, I think everything that this guy does, it's it's amazing to see. And and going back to near the start, talking about how when he got into the trucking world, you know, he would literally go and knock on people's uh, truck doors and you know go for rides, ask them, you know, how what do they like about it, and learned about his essentially target audience, although. Saying target audience is, it might seem a little negative, but in, in amongst it, he's just trying to learn about his, his clients and, and to be able to understand what's important to them and then to find that in the truck. So again, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Promo Minds podcast. And until next time, take care. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Promo Minds Podcast. I'm Steve Leslie. And if you want help crafting your message or sharing your story, feel free to reach out. I'd love to help. I uh, love coming up with ideas. And, uh, you know, we can have a nice chat. So reach out to Promo Minds at 
gmail.com and I'll respond. Take care.